And I thank you. <laughs> thank you. I thank you. Uh, it's really been a pleasure. This is my first time to Seoul, Korea, and uh, my wife and I have enjoyed it so far. I wish we could spend more time here. I hope we will. But right now, we're so busy learning, we can't go out to the city. But it's still really enjoyable to meet everybody, including some familiar faces and many new faces, too. I apologize if I talk too fast for my morning lecture. I only had 20 minutes. This time, I will try and talk a little slower because I'm the only speaker. So... <laughs> So, and, and I think most of this information I'm going to give you is probably nothing you don't know anyway, because I think, as we say, we have a uh, saying in English, we're preaching to the converted. The fact that everyone's here means everybody believes in pathology and learning about autopsy, so I don't have to convert anybody. We already know. We already know how important it is and, and how it will continue to be important going forward to, even though we have all these other t forms of non-invasive, powerful non-invasive in imaging right now. I don't have any disclosures that are relevant to this presentation. The question I have, and I was thinking of a song in English, they, they say, you know, where have all the flowers gone? That was back in the 60s. Well, I think I said in my mind, I said, where have all the autopsies gone? The problem is, is that autopsies is, you probably, I don't know if it's the same thing in Korea, but autopsies are not nearly as common anymore as they were back in, in the United States back 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, really, because of the time back then, we really didn't have anything else. We couldn't establish the diagnosis any, any other way than autopsy, and we really didn't understand the morphology of congenital heart disease unless we actually opened up the hearts themselves. And of course, there were many more at the time because many more patients were dying then. They didn't have the surgery that they have now. So the pioneers, and this is not a complete list. In fact, they mentioned Dr. Dr. Van Mirop, and I forgot to put him in. Maud Al Ad Abbott, Maury Lev, Saraja Barota, Baroti, Jesse Edwards, Stella Richard Van Prague, Robert Anderson, among others. The list goes on and on. Some great pioneers who unfortunately are moving a while out. They're getting older now. But they're the ones who established where we are today. And they're the ones who established the nomenclature and insight into congenital heart disease that we now use today. And in fact, the segmental approach, which, I th which really Dr. Van Prague was instrumental in bringing to the, the congenital heart world, he really took from his extensive study of specimens back in Boston, too. So all the language that we use now, even though there are some differences between Dr. Anderson and Dr. Van Prague, but all the, all the terminology and the concepts we use now are really based on the study aut of autopsy specimens. This is just the two of them, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Van Prague. And of course, we could have many, many more other people too, because it's really been an incredible uh, group of people who have defined this field. The thing is that non-invasive imaging, especially echocardiography, and now MRI and CT, have greatly changed the need for autopsy with more precise diagnoses in living patients and therefore markedly fewer surprises. Those of us who are great institutions who have great non-invasive imaging know that we get very few surprises now when we do our, non when we do our diagnoses. And in fact, with improved surgical results, we have markedly re reduced mortality. So due to, these, due to these and other factors, autopsy results have decreased dramatically. There are other things that are important, too. There are religious and cultural factors, too. Nowadays, people feel a little more uncomfortable asking for autopsies. There's an unwillingness or lack of enthusiasm on the part of physicians to seek an autopsy, especially if they already know the diagnosis. They don't really get, want to get one. Nowadays, it's hard to get it paid for. I mean, it's just not as easy for, uh, for autopsies to be paid. I don't know if it's the same thing here in Korea or in Japan or in the Far East, but in the United States, it's a little bit more difficult, too. And so it got, has gotten to the point where some studies have even raised the possibility of postmortem imaging using MRI, CT scan as a substitute for autopsy. Just to show you right here, this is from the New England Journal. Uh, they had a nice article just talking about autopsies. And the fact, if you look back in the years of 1965, really around 1970s, look at Brigham Women's Hospital. I mean, that was a major academic center. He had about 70 percent autopsy rate. And that has dropped significantly, probably down into below 20 percent or even below that. Same thing with the Mayo Clinic, which I think parallels it and has this outstanding pathology collection. Same thing with Yale New Haven Hospital, which is a little bit lower, but I think you can see that the trends are pretty much there, and, and really the trends at our hospital are pretty, pretty much the same thing, too. Also, again, reflecting the fact that we have a lower death rate just in general. This was an article that came out in 2015, which I thought was really interesting. Steve Sanders brought that to my attention, and he, a group of people, are actually are trying to, were trying to advocate doing post-mortem CT scan to, as an, in lieu of autopsy to look at a lot of different things. This, of course, is a non-moving patient, so you don't need to worry about breath holding. And so <laughs> this, they got beautiful, beautiful images here. 
But also they did some things looking at the heart with a patient here with aortic stenosis and hypertrophy and showing some uh, EFE as well. So, you know, they're just trying to say that maybe we can use this as an alternative. Parents don't really want to give up the autopsy. And we heard also about how families are a little bit more reserved and don't necessarily want to donate the hearts to science, too. So the question is, is the autopsy going the way of the dinosaur? I mean, are people going to just not do autopsies less and less? Are they doing them less and less? And I think all of us here, it looks like a fairly big crowd over here, feel otherwise. Despite superior non-invasive imaging and continued improvement on odd technology, these techniques cannot get the fine detail of odd autopsy. This is my own, my, own, my own feeling, including the microscopic and histologic confirmation that sometimes you need with the ultrastructural abnormalities, as well as some genetic testing if you need that too. The other thing that I think we find, and you'll find as you look at these specimens, and it is a great love of mine too, is you really learn a lot about anatomy and pathology that is not available, at least right now, with other current modalities. And I hate to say this, even 3D printing has its limitations too, particularly when it comes to the valve structures and some of the fine details. You just don't have that with a really good autopsy or pathology specimen. And sometimes the confirmation of findings can be quite dramatic and memorable. It is extremely important and useful for teaching and learning out cardiography. I was in one, on the committee that sat with the, in, the, in, uh, in the United States on trying to recommend echocardiography, recommendations for fellows in terms of training. And we all feel that pathology still plays a very important role in teaching fellows too. Now, not every place has one available, but we feel lucky that we do. So I think those places that have it need to continue to harness it and use it as you have done here so well. The actual process of analyzing the heart along the lines of blood flow is incredibly valuable in understanding segmental approach. Also, to maintain a registry of specimens for teaching and reevaluation, I think, is very, very useful. They're invaluable teaching aids, and it's also becoming increasingly difficult to find a patient that hasn't been operated on with complex heart disease. And so, therefore, it's really nice to have these older registries. Also, some of these procedures don't we, see, we don't see anymore, Watterson, POTS, shunt, things of that sort. We have some of those in our registry, too. It's kind of fun to show uh, fellows and, and, re, and you know, residents about that. Mustard procedures, sending procedures, we don't see that much anymore. It's kind of nice to show what does that look like. And some unusual specimens are literally one of a kind, and these can illustrate some very important principles of CHD evaluation. So, uh, and, and the last thing, of course, is that the autopsy still is the, considered the gold standard for a lot of things, too, when you're really not sure about it. Now, what are some of the potential disadvantages of autopsy and pathology and where you really need these non-invasive tools or live imaging? First of all, you really need somebody who likes this and knows what to do with it, too. And so I can tell you that most pathologists in the, in the United States, just board, you know, board certified pathologists, don't have a lot of understanding of congenital heart disease. So you really need somebody who has really good understanding of congenital heart disease. And that takes time. It takes somebody who's really interested in doing it. So I do it over at Children's, but I don't get paid more because I do it. It's part of something that I like doing. I enjoy doing. It's my passion. But if you don't have somebody who's like that, you may not have, it may not be as easy. And it is very time labor intensive. Sometimes it takes me a couple hours to work with somebody to dissect a heart, especially if it's a post more a patient who's had several surgeries and a lot of scarring and very complex. It can take a while. And the other thing, too, is that you have to dissect it carefully, too. Otherwise, you're going to hack things up. Hacking means just chopping things up, you know, sort of like with a Ginsu knife or something like that, <laughs> so to speak. You don't want to do that. You really have to be careful. You have to take care of these specimens almost lovingly to be able to look at them. And that also requires that you know exactly what was done, what, was, what happened. So I have to review a lot of the imaging. I have to review a lot of the history to make sure I know exactly what are the questions I need. The other thing is that when do you do an autopsy? Those of you who have done autopsies, sometimes you do it on a fresh specimen and sometimes on a specimen that has been fixed in formaldehyde. The ones that are fixed in formaldehyde are nice because they're obviously they're, they're cleaner and they're easier to open up, but they aren't as malleable. They, they can't move, you can't move them around. So sometimes I like to do off a fresh specimen because I can move things around a little bit more. I can fold and bend the heart a little bit, but the tissue planes are not as well defined. Some, the other thing, too, is remember that one other thing is that we do have limitations because it's not real time. So we have no idea about where his blood flow is going. We can infer that there's a lot of regurgitation from a valve that's abnormal. But really, how much do you really know how much regurgitation from that? And how do you know about cardiac function? How, I mean, the heart can be dilated. We can know that the patient had dilated cardiomyopathy. But do you really know exactly how much dyskinesis? And there are certain structures that are difficult to evaluate by a pathologic exam. Coronary sinusoids are very, for me, I've always been very difficult to look at coronary sinusoids. 
by by uh, pathology. It's just very hard to dissect all that out. Bizarre systemic and pulmonary venous patterns, lymphatic drainage. That's so difficult to tell, and that's where I think premortem imaging does make a play a role. So nowadays, I think pathologists and cardiac pathologists work in concert with the non-invasive findings, the invasive findings, to really get a much more comprehensive picture of what it's like to really, what, what the patient's heart was like. But the autopsy plays a very important role. Important questions can be known, should be known to discuss prior to autopsy, and this helps to streamline the autopsy a little bit more so we're not just looking in the dark with a flashlight. And the cardiologist and cardiac surgeon can be present. We've had Dr. Kim on a few uh, when he's uh, going to come over in a couple of cases. Unfortunately, some of them are his cases. <laughs> and we've talked a little bit about that, but he provides some valuable insight because of the things that we looked at. And I'm going to show an interesting specimen regarding that. Now, what are some of the type of examples of valuable findings obtained from an autopsy pathology evaluation? And again, I'm not going to give you a lot of this. I'm just going to show a few interesting examples because I'm sure everybody has seen a lot of this on their own. It's insight into structural ad cardiac anatomy and pathology, AV canal defects, conotruncal abnormalities, other abnormalities, things that really don't understand that well, even looking at the 2D and 3D imaging on a screen. This is, there's nothing like taking that specimen in your hands and looking at it. There's good correlation with non-invasive imaging, too. We often use it to correlate, our patho the, especially the autopsy, any findings that we have. Fortunately, we find that most of the time we're right, but every once in a while we get fooled. Reinforcement applications of findings not readily seen or understood by non-invasive or invasive imaging. And I'm going to show you a very interesting example of that. And the newer surprise findings, sometimes we do find something that's a little bit weird, but does explain what happened and, and will teach us this a little bit, too. So let me just give you an example of each one of those, and just four brief examples, and then we can get on to the pathology here. I'll show you a patient with 14-year-old with arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia, which we know manifests with ventricular arrhythmias and right-sided heart failure. It's a terrible condition there, and so this patient underwent heart transplantation, not strictly speaking an autopsy. It was really just <coughs> taking the old heart, but I remember taking the old heart and going, wow, this is fantastic. Now, the MRI and the echo were done, and I only have the echo, unfortunately, I don't have the MRI, but you can see how poorly functioning this echo is here. Look at that, very, very abnormal, very large right atrium, and a lot of regurgitation of this uh, tricuspid valve. Do you have this condition a lot here in, in Korea, ARVD? Not so much, but maybe a few, right? Yeah, and they look like this, and they're abnormal, there's no doubt about it. But the interesting thing about this over here, and you can kind of see how this tricuspid valve is not closing, and there's a lot of regurgitation. This patient was having a lot of problems, and there's some mitral regurgitation as well. The LV function looks okay, not great. You can't tell a whole lot more by echo, and I can tell you the MRI didn't really add a whole lot. It showed that there was some thin wall, poorly functioning RV. Look at that uh, tricuspid valve not moving well at all. And then you see the specimen. Look at this. Now, this, is a tri this is incredible. This is all fat. In, uh, in the U.S., we, uh, we, we have a, a word in Spanish we call it, like, it looks like a chicharron. Looks, like <laughs> looks like a big pork chip, so it's like. But I thought this was just amazing because I had never seen one of these myself. You can see the fat covering, completely covering the front and back of the heart here. But not only that, but infiltrating the walls of the whole right ventricle. Look at this. This is the right ventricle opened up over here. Here's the papillary muscle lens, cheesy we heard about. Look at this RF free, free wall. It has been replaced almost completely by fat. In fact, we transluminated here, and that's all you got. And that's the reason why this thing isn't moving at all. Now, does it make a huge difference? Not, maybe not really, but I think it gives a little bit of insight into what's going on. And when you see this, you really can't appreciate this by, by any of the other non-invasive means here. And you can see how thick that, that fat wall is here. But the other thing that's interesting is that it actually affected both sides. What we found over here, we went over here, you can see this yellow streak here. There's fat also around the aortic valve and mitral valve. We, here's the interior of the left ventricle, and we opened up a papillary muscle, and we could see that there was fat in there, too. So this is a disease that affects not only the right side, but actually affects the left side, too. So it's just a fascinating example of that. Let me show you another interesting example of a patient, a newborn baby. This is correlation with imaging. A newborn baby with a history of hypoplastic left heart syndrome, diagnosed prenatal, postnatally, begun on PG, transferred to CHLA for evaluation, but on an X-ray noted to have asymmetric opacification of the right lung, an echocardiogram confirmed hypoplastic left heart syndrome, left pulmonary venous drainage to the left atrium. Right pulmonary venous drainage was unclear, and we did a cardiac cath which showed partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. All the right veins grained in the anomalous vein with a 24 millimeter mean gradient from where before to after that. So you know it's highly obstructed. Patient was not felt to be a candidate for surgery and ultimately left to expire. So we had this fresh specimen over here. I'm not going to show you a whole lot about it, but I will show you some. 
just to show you, here is the admission x-ray, and this is one who had been sent over to go for a Norwood procedure. And look what happened over the next few days. You had both sort of an obstructed veins pattern and as well as fl fluid in the right lung there too. This is just to show you the angiogram. I don't, I'm not going to show the echo, but you can see here's the asgus vein draining into this over here. And actually, and Frank will probably correct me if I'm wrong here, but then if you have the, you inject in the right pulmonary artery, you will see that the right pulmonary veins come back to the asgus and then back into the SVC. And uh, sorry, let me just go down here. And you can see here, we're actually in the vein. So here it's, tw it's like 26 millimeters, and afterwards it's tight 2 millimeters. So there's a 24 millimeter ring gradient across this very narrow area. That's the whole right lung. Look what the right lung looks like over here. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? I had never seen anything this dramatic, and I know the surgeons see this. This is what we call a cobblestone type appearance, too. And also, we see some very nice features that confirm that it's hypoplastic left heart syndrome, the SVC, the ascending aorta, MPA over here. A beautiful example over here. Here's the innominate vein. Here's the right pulmonary artery. And you can see this really abnormal looking lung over here. It's just incredible. Uh, this is really the heart, how beautifully you can see this, the eric arch, the ascending aorta, very small, only a couple millimeters in diameter. And uh, basically just showing over here, here's the azagus going up into the, uh, into the SVC, and here are the right point veins, and they'll come down. This is actually where they enter into. Here's the SVC, this is the entrance into the SVC of all those right veins coming in there, too. And only measured about a millimeter in diameter, too. The other thing that's interesting is here's the left ventricle. Look how small it is. It's tiny. This, I didn't show you the echo, but this was a very tiny thing. There was actually a little blood clot in it, so this is the cast of the blood clot, too. How small it is there. There was barely anything there at all. And again, this is the, the right point veins coming back into this kind of, into this little chamber, over, uh, little, little confluence, if you will, over here, too, that eventually entered into the ascus vein. So this was very useful to us. Look at also, uh, just take a look at how bad the right lung looks. So the right lung looks terrible here. Same type of thing, just uh, really a abnormal compared to the left lung. So just, it didn't read it, it, we didn't show anything that we didn't know anyway, but it did help to confirm to us that it was really a problem. Now let me show you something that's really interesting, and I'm not sure if a lot of people know about this condition, but it is unusual. This is a so-called intramural VSD. Strictly speaking, it's not a true VSD. I don't know how many of you have seen one of these. It's not really an actual break of communication in the ventricular septum. There's a, by the way, there's only been, been about five, or five papers published on this subject. In fact, we have a, a report going into the, get, in, in publication, uh, coming out pretty soon about it as well, showing some of these pictures. But this is what's interesting, is that it's a, a series of channels or channels that occur in conotruncal abnormalities after a patient has had surgery. And what happens is that, and I'll show you in just a moment, it becomes manifest because of the way the surgery is done. So, this is for actually, for, it was first reported in 1994, and that just goes to show you from 1994 to now, only five papers have been reported about it. Uh, this is over here. So this is a patient who might have, let's say, this is DORV, and a VSD patch over here. And you can see when the patch anchors to these trabeculations on the wall over here, it actually then separates this chamber from this chamber. So instead of having 100 millimeter pressure all across, now you have a pressure gradient, and you can have, you have these channels that can open up, plus the patch can pull out and cause what's called an intramural VSD, okay? So this is different because it's not truly a VSD. It's not really a defect in the septum. It's not a peri patch. It's actually an interventricular, interventricular communication through walls, channels in the right ventricle. Okay, right ventricle. Very difficult to be able to appreciate. I can tell you the surgeons have a devil of a time trying to figure this one out. And the other thing, the interesting thing about it too is that it can be the cause of a lot of morb morbidity and mortality like this patient. This patient had tetralogy flow and TAPVR and was known to have heart failure, had this intramural VSD, underwent CT surgery, and they tried to close this from several different points of view. First, they went from the RV outflow track, and of course, the way this thing is, it's not a peri-patch VSD, so you're not going to find it around the patch itself. So they looked there, they tried to find it, they tried to close what there was there, and so it looked like it was a, but it, it, there was still a defect afterwards. Afterward, at three years of age, it was still there, and it was, the patient was not doing well. They, the defect was known to be very anterior. They could not get, get it by a, by a pump run. They tried to do an LV apical incision, which I don't really personally care for, and still could not see it. Because of course, you wouldn't see it, because if you understood this defect, there's no way you can see it from the LV apex. It's way on the RV side. Post-op TE continued to show residual intramural VSD. They tried to take the kid to the cath lab, tried to place a device, didn't work. Eventually, a patient went, came back inspired. 
I'm going to show you the echo and show you what the echo looks like here. This is an apical VSD, a, a, apical four-chamber view. This is the uh, aortic valve over here. And what you'll start to see now, there is the patch. There's no leak around the patch. But if you look up here, these are those channels. This is the aortic valve, and these are the channels. And now we'll put some color flow Doppler onto this. And you will see that these flow, this flow goes right through and into the right ventricle over here. So you see it's going right through the wall of the right ventricle. This is a so-called intramural VSD. And it can be a considerable amount of blood that goes through this that can cause a patient to go into a lot of heart failure. I can tell you it's very difficult for the surgeons to see because it's quite anterior. So they almost have to look, they almost have to have a dental mirror to be able to take a look at it. And I remember Dr. Kim was talking about how you might have to transect the aorta and pull it up to be able to see it. He did get, was able to close one of those successfully one time, but I can tell you it's not easy to do, and this is why it's so difficult for the surgeons uh, here. This is the angiogram. Look at this. Now, if you look at the angiogram, you think it's a peri-patch VSD here. If you're not careful, there's a little mouth, if you will, a little spigot right there through which this, uh, this uh, blood goes, and you can see there's a tremendous amount of left to right shunning here. And this is just a 3D that kind of shows it. It's probably not as good, but I just want to show that essentially it's like a little waterfall. Look at all these channels that come through right here. And that's what's happening. And this is actually on FOSS. I tried to do it in all FOSS view, and I said, eh, I don't know if that's true, until I actually saw the, uh, the example of here. This patient actually just shows that the patient had continued problems and eventually passed away from a sudden death. So this is, this is what it looks like. And this, I think this is where it really helped a lot. This is the right ventricle over here. Here's the, this patient actually had a little Contegra valve here, too. And here's the right ventricle. And here's the patch. See, okay, there's one patch here. There's another patch that was placed by the surgeon here to try and close stuff. And there's no obvious residual peri-patch VSD, okay? And we see all these things over here, and you're going, what are these? Well, these actually turn out to be some of the channels through which the blood exits. But you can't tell that just by looking at, the, uh, just by looking at them uh, or uh, about themselves. And certainly you couldn't sur tell in surgery about that. The, this is from the left ventricle side. This is the LV apical. They tried to close what they could, but you can see you're not even close. This is the VSD patch over here. And this is it from the left ventricle. Again, the left ventricle receptacle over here. Now, this is that defect over here. Look, this is the intramural defect. It is between the non and right coronary. I think this is kind of like the right coronary cusp and non coronary cusp over here. But it's between the two. It's right underneath the aortic valve, and it is quite anterior. And it's very large, and it's got multiple channels. You can see the size of it. It's about a centimeter in diameter. Tremendously big. A lot of blood going across it there, too. And now I fixed the specimen a little bit. We fixed it and looked back at it, and some of these channels going through, too. This is it. Now, we opened the RV off track from the other side. Look at how this comes in here. There's, there is the entry point from the left ventricle. It goes all through all these different channels over here and exits out. And then this is actually, we put a probe in while it was fresh and, put, and we were able to enter several different channels there through with this probe. It just shows you how you have multiple exit points there. And so what really you see here is that you can see that here's the left ventricle and right ventricle is that this VSD goes through underneath and out the aorta here. And here is the VSD right here, the intramural VSD right underneath the aortic valve. Very difficult to find. No way you can find it at the left ventricle. Or even if you're opening up the RV alpha track, you're not, not going to find it there either. So this is a very useful type of thing that we learned about. This is going to be from our, our publication that just shows the uh, different modalities. We did do an MRI that showed the same thing. But I just wanted to show a very unusual type of thing. Have people seen intramural VSD? Maybe you had a few here? It's a very unusual type of defect. Anyway, we, this gave us a lot of insight. Then find my last, I think, uh, slide I have is on new and surprise findings. This was very interesting as well. A full-term baby born by repeat C-section, no prenatal diagnosis, noted to be cyanotic shortly after birth, oxygen saturation in the 70s, and echo showed a pulmonary attrition tax septum transferred to the CHLA. And the thing is that we did small, notice that the RV was very small, so we decided not to do any more imaging at all. And I, I know there are a lot of places that don't, and we usually do an aortogram, but we decided not to do it in this particular patient. I, you guys do aerograms and all your pulmonary attrition tax septum? Or, or RV, do you catheter button? Or if it's too small, you just put a shunt in? I guess everyone's different right there. Anyway, this patient, unfortunately, after they put the BT shunt in nature of subtectomy, the patient was transported, had arrhythmias, hypertension, placed on ECMO, and eventually expired because of essentially complete inactivity of the heart. So this is just going to, I'm just going to show you the echo. We don't have much else here. Just to show you a few things here. There is the ASD here. It's pretty good size. Here's the RV. It's just tiny. LV has good function. This is pre-op here. Good aortic valve. Good left ventricular function. Some MR. Not too bad. 
But I want to show over here, as you can see, there's pretty good wall motion. It's not really that dyskinetic. Here's the Eric valve here, and the one thing that's not so clear from this is where do the corners come off of, okay? Well, if you're not going to unroof it, the, t the dogma is then you don't worry about it, because even if it's RV dependent, you're not going to worry about it, right? You just, just open the HLCEP, then you do a shunt, you're going to do a uh, Fontan, so on, right? That's kind of what we think about, right? Until we started looking at our autopsy findings over here, and what we'll see here is the following. First of all, that's the atrial septum. That's pretty floppy. I think they didn't open it much. It was already kind of floppy here. But you can see already there's some infarctions. There's a lot of areas of infarction in the, right, in the ventricle over here. There's a small RV over here, and there, I think there might actually be some sinusoidos. It's hard to see. Here are the corneries on the surface of the heart. The one thing that was really interesting and kind of surprising, by the way, there's pulmonary atresia here. That's the MPA over here. Here's the atrial septum from this side. As you can see how dilated, here's the left ventricle, how dilated it is. And there's also areas of infarction that you actually see on the ventricular septum. But here's the, here's the money right here, money shot right here, where you see here's the aortic valve. This is the non-coronary non cusp right and left. And it, though it looks like coronary should come off of them, there are no coronaries come off of them at all. So not, in fact, every, this was a pure RV-dependent right, uh, coronary circulation. There was no coronary at all connecting to the aorta. And I think that was one of the things that, was, that taught us something right there. Had we known that for sure, we probably would not have done surgery this kid. This kid, maybe you do a hybrid, maybe, I mean, maybe you do a ductal stent, or maybe you just do, but I think you do as little as possible for this particular patient, and maybe you set, set this kid up for a, tra a transplant. And had, this kid had diffuse infarctions, not surprisingly. I'm sure after they uh, put the shunt in, maybe they open, maybe the atrial septum, it didn't look like it was that open, but it, the kid was very destabilized. They were worried about a BT shunt uh, thr thr thrombus. There was none. This is all post-mortem, post so that was okay. So in summary, uh, I think a pathology registry and active cardiac autopsy service are invaluable for any top-notch pediatric cardiac program. It strengthens understanding. It's good to have somebody who really understands the pathology, can argue with the surgeons about it too, all that. I think it's be likely, it will continue to be important in the future for verification, even with higher resolution imaging, 3D printing, virtual reality, and even holography if that comes into play. And training in pathology continues to be a highly recommended tool for cardiology and cardiac surgery trainees. And this is, your this is a beautiful Yosemite Falls in Yosemite. If you've never been there, if you come to the United States, I highly recommend you go. It's beautiful. It's one of the, it's like the fourth or fifth lo longest, how tall falls in the world. It's beautiful. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah.